Hello and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Anthony Rodriguez, and I am the interim chapter president of the newly established El Paso chapter, uh, Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, our inaugural event, and we are pleased that you have taken time to spend with us, spend your time with us. Um, should you know anyone else who may be interested in hearing more about the Federal Society, we'll give some information at the very end. Um, please feel free to do so. Um, if this is your first time at a society event, again, welcome. Um, the Federal Society is a national organization of approximately 40,000 lawyers, law students, scholars, and other individuals interested in the current state of the legal order. Uh, while the Federal Society takes no position on particular issues, legal or public policy considerations or questions, it is founded on the principles that the, that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to the Constitution, and it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. Um, today, I want to emphasize that any positions taken on specific legal or political issues are those of the speakers and do not reflect an organizational stance. Today, we are fortunate to hear from Clark Neely and Judd Stone. Um, in no particular order, I, I will begin with, with Mr. Neely's introduction. Uh, Clark Neely is the Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. Uh, many of you in the audience probably know and have heard this introduction many, many times given um, Mr. Neely does an event or two um, here or there. Uh, his writing appears frequently on, in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and various uh, law reviews. Um, prior to joining Cato, um, Mr. Neely was a senior attorney and constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice and the Institute Center for Judicial Engagement, where he wrote the book that some of you may have seen him show earlier. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at the U University of Texas School of Law, where he teaches constitutional litigation and public interest law. Uh, Mr. Neely served as co-counsel in District of Columbia against Heller, the historic case in which the Supreme Court held for the first time that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own a gun for self-defense. And he began his legal career as a law clerk to Judge Royce Lambert on the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. After that, he spent four years in the trial department of the Dallas-based firm Thompson and Knight. And he received his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Texas, where he was chief articles editor for the Texas Law Review. Judd Stone is an assistant Texas Solicitor General where he is responsible for representing Texas by directly handing, handling appeals determined significant to the state. Before joining the SG's office in 2020, Stone was chief counsel for Senator Ted Cruz and previously practiced at Morgan, Lewis, and Bacchius in their Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group in Washington, D.C., and at Kellogg, Hanson, Todd, Sigel, and Frederick. He also served as an Olin Surly Fel a Smith Fellow at Harvard Law School. Stone began his legal career as a law clerk to Justice Antonin Scalia in the United States Supreme Court, to then Chief Judge Edith Jones in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and for Justice Daniel Winfrey on the Alaska Supreme Court. He received his law degree from Northwestern University and his undergraduate degree from the University of Texas, Dallas. Normally, um, at this point, we would invite the audience to help us welcome our, uh, our panelists, but Obviously, COVID has other ideas, and none of us are in person together, but um, COVID hasn't necessarily stopped us from doing great things in the past, and so in, in light of that, I, I would join you to help me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> so I, I want to give a quick breakdown of format and, and how we're going to proceed this evening. Um, I will note from the outset that you, you will notice that there is a Q&A function. Um, question and answers are already open, so you please feel free at any point to submit a question. Uh, we will get to those at the end. Um, I will begin briefly by just giving a, a what appears a relevant background on um, Section 1983 as well as qualified immunity to kind of set the stage. Um, then uh, Mr. Stone will begin and provide his principal delivery, followed by uh, Mr. Neely, and then we'll have a back and forth um, that will ultimately culminate in turning the questions to the audience. Um, so with that said, um, we'll launch straight in. The theme of today's event is, is obviously to discuss the, the doctrine of qualified immunity, but I, I think I would be remiss in setting us down that path without first kind of at least setting the foundation as to how we've reached this point. Um, before 
most of the time before a qualified immunity suit will arise, first an individual will file a, a claim in federal court under Title 42 United States, United States Code Section 1983. Um, in the interest of time, 1983 allows an individual who has suffered a constitutional statutory violation to sue for money damages. The result of that suit primarily is met with the assertion of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity simply stated uh, allows officials to assert the, um, to become immune from suit and liability, so damages as well as liability. And the doctrine as it presently exists, um, I believe we will, we will get a, a much more robust historical breakdown shortly, but at least in its current form, it, there are essentially two principal cases. The first is Pearson against Ray, where the Supreme Court first extended qualified immunity back in 1967. And second is Harlow against Fitzgerald. Harlow against Fitzgerald is, is extremely significant in the sense that in Pearson against Ray, the, the consideration was whether the officer acted in good faith. Peer, uh, excuse me, Harlow, by contrast, imposed what has been described as a clearly established analysis. Um, in extending this doctrine, the Supreme Court stated that qualified immunity is, quote, it reflects an attempt to balance competing values, not only the importance of a damages remedy to protect the rights of citizens, but also the need to protect officials who are required to exercise their discretion and the related public interest in encouraging the vigorous exercise of official authority. Substantively, qualified immunity protects government officials, and it's a two-pronged inquiry. One is that it will protect them unless their alleged conduct violated a constitutional or statutory right, and two, that the illegality of the alleged conduct was clearly established at the time. Now, I'm not going to delve into the procedural, um, given that there, there is a case that says they can be determined in either, either format and there's no sequence that must be followed. I'm going to going to skip through that and, and mostly go to the heart of the matter, and that is um, what exactly is clearly established. Um, in, in this circuit, uh, in a case called Garcia against Blevins, it was recently decided, a panel stated that to be clearly established, a right must, quote, be sufficiently clear that every reasonable official would have understood what he is doing violates that right. And, and that quote is taken with citation to a Supreme Court case from 2015 called Mullinex against Luna. In Malley against Briggs in 1986, the Supreme Court succinctly summarized the, the emerging status of qualified immunity by stating that it provides ample protection to all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. Now, the, the brunt of today's discussion is largely going to stem or is going to center on police officer conduct. And the courts, in, in looking to police officer conduct, while still embodying and employing the same general principles, look to cases that are that squarely govern govern the facts at issue, particularly like in the force context. And courts, the Supreme Court has admonished the lower courts that they cannot define clearly established law at a high level of generality. And Ashcroft against uh, Iqbal. Rather, the question must be framed with specificity and granularity. And the courts must not require plaintiffs to identify a case that is directly on point, but the case law must place the statutory or constitutional question beyond debate. In excessive force cases, officers are entitled to that immunity unless existing precedent will squarely govern, which is, a, uh, which is pulled from Casella against Hughes, a 2018 per curiam decision. And with that, I turn the floor over to Mr. Stone. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining Clark and I tonight, where we're going to debate qualified immunity, as Anthony just uh, gave us a good intro on. I'm grateful to Anthony and to the Federalist Society for the chance to speak to you. And just as an initial disclaimer, the views I express tonight are exclusively my own. So we're having this debate at all is a testament to just how effective Clark has been. We're in the throes of months-long riots in several major American cities. Violent crime rates, especially homicide rates, are on the rise. Where our debate today is, in essence, how much easier it should be to sue the police. I say little or none, Clark says a great deal. This is a very effective movement. 
So as a preliminary matter, I want to explain where I see the qualified immunity debate. Now, Anthony gave most of the historical background at sort of the very high level, or at least much of it. Following the Civil War, Congress passed what's now codified, codified at 42 U.S.C. 1983, which provides, to give you a sort of quick quote, every person who, under color of any statute or other source of law, who deprives any citizen of the United States of rights secured by the Constitution and its laws shall be liable. Qualified immunity is defense to liability from the statute, excusing official conduct unless it violated, as Anthony discussed, clearly established law. Now, qualified immunity's opponents usually present their case in sort of two major steps. The first is a moral case, where they cast the immunity debate between basically guilty police officers on one side and their victims on another. Second is a legal case. They argue that qualified immunity is wrong because it doesn't appear in the text of Section 1983. And they appeal to us as good textualists not to support a doctrine that doesn't appear on the face of a statute. I think we can safely acknowledge there's an appeal to both of these arguments. On the moral side, there are police officers who commit unspeakable acts. I have no doubt Clark has an encyclopedic knowledge of these and he'll be able to list them in detail. And I have no doubt we'll be able to agree at least some of them are indefensible. On the legal side, as a textualist, which I am and no doubt many of you are, we should be suspicious of statutory interpretations without an obvious basis in the text of a statute. But I think each of these points are ultimately incomplete and unconvincing. I'd like to organize my presentation around completing them through three points. First, a moral point. The immunity is only for bad cops narrative leads out hundreds of thousands of officers and other officials who rely on immunity in millions of official actions per day. Second, a legal point. Contrary to what qualified immunity critics insist, and as Clark will detail to you, there is a good historical case, as recently outlined by Scott Keller, for some type of freestanding official immunity that is much closer to what we have now than what Clark will advocate for. Finally, a prudential point. Even if you think I'm wrong on the merits through and through, I'd like to appeal to your sense of caution before overturning quite literally thousands of cases that affect quite literally a million or more public servants. So let me start with my moral case. The anti-immunity, immunity is only for bad cops story is, like I said, deeply incomplete. I want to start out here with some basic assumptions because these often go unsaid in charge topics or topics about law enforcement. There are around 750,000 or so law enforcement officers in, in this country along with hundreds of thousands of more public officials and employees. Qualified immunity exists to protect these officials as well as the bad ones during the course of their, perform of their performance of very difficult, sometimes very dangerous jobs. Like I mentioned before, there are of course a few officers who deliberately commit terrible acts. Those officials should face the criminal justice system, not just the civil system. And to be clear, the victims also should receive civil remedies too, as many do, even with qualified immunity as it's currently in place. For contemporary examples, the families of Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Laquan McDonald, and Eric Garner each have settled their Section 1983 claims for millions of dollars. George Floyd's family has filed a Section 1983 action as well, and quite frankly, I very much doubt their case will be thrown out due to qualified immunity. Nor should it. But qualified immunity critics don't want to end immunity only for bad officers. They want to end it for everyone. When I think about immunity, I don't just consider the guilty officers. I think about the hundreds of thousands of well-meaning ones who have good intentions and difficult jobs. But look, it's very easy for me and for Clark to say that police officers have a tough job. Clark and I are litigators. I'm sure many of you are too. We file papers. Sometimes we get up before a podium and argue. When we begin our arguments, many of us feel a sort of jolt of excitement, an awareness that we're about to defend our clients' interests. That's in part because we're clean, keenly aware that our clients have rights, and if we screw up, those could be imperiled or just waived altogether. In the worst of it, we could be held liable in a professional malpractice action, which is, of course, a negligence regime. In other words, we get to explain our mistakes. So it's a little counterintuitive that qualified immunities critics are going to present to you a strict liability regime, basically, where the good faith of an officer or the ability of an officer to make a reasonable mistake simply won't be a defense to liability under, under 1983 or other civil rights statutes. That's a standard that we as lawyers would never tolerate on ourselves, and that I think most people would find, like I said, deeply counterintuitive, especially considering that we, Clark and I, have the luxury of knowing no matter how badly we perform, no one's gonna pull a gun on us at the podium. More to the point, I think people respond to incentives. 
we reduce the barriers to suing the police, we get more suits against the police. Put a finer point on it, eliminating qualified immunity will mean more cops. Those who've done nothing wrong will get sued. Immunity's critics love to pretend the trade-off here is between plaintiff's rights, vindicating constitutional rights, and protecting bad officers. It's not. It's between vindicating constitutional rights through a damages action and additional suits against good officers. Like many hard political decisions, like many hard policy decisions, it's between two desirable things. We want to be able to vindicate constitutional rights and we want to protect innocent police officers. But you can't have both. They trade off with one another. And the risk of additional suits will discourage good people from going into public service, will deter police from taking risks when protecting the public, will result, quite frankly, in higher crime. Next to legal case. Clark's legal case is simple. Section 1983 doesn't mention qualified immunity or clearly established law, so that sort of immunity shouldn't exist. Like many simple arguments, it's intuitively appealing, and it's also wrong. As professors Aaron Nielsen and Christopher Walker point out, Congress passes laws against the backdrop of common law principles, including common law defenses. Let me give you a foundational era, sort of founding era example. When the first Congress passed the, the Crimes Act of 1790, it didn't mention common law defenses like self-defense or defense of others, even though it dealt with, well, homicide, including others. In fact, Congress specifically mentioned one common law principle, sort of in the nature of an affirmative defense, called the benefit of clergy, where some defendants convicted of capital crimes could be spared death if they could show they were literate. It abolished the benefit of clergy, the benefit of clergy and said nothing about the rest. But no one supposes Congress abolished defense of self as an affirmative defense in 1790 just because they didn't mention it. Congress in the Reconstruction era worked the same way, and the Supreme Court inferred defenses from 1800 statutes in the same way. For example, only two years before Section 1983's enactment, the Supreme Court inferred a defense for state officials against a federal statute prohibiting obstruction of the mail service. The point here is that when a long common law defense or common law principle exists, the it isn't in the text, so it isn't there principle quite isn't, quite frankly, so simple. So we also have to look to the historical immunity defenses in the 19th century. Recent scholarship forthcoming in the Stanford Law Review by Scott Keller, a former Solicitor General of Texas, suggests there was in fact a pervasive immunity defense at common law. Keller reviewed four well-regarded treatises, including Cooley's 1879 Law of Torts, Bishop's 1889 Commentaries on Non-Contract Law, Meacham's 1890 Law of Public Offices and Officers, and Throop's 1892 Law Relating to Public Officers, along with numerous 19th century Supreme Court and State Supreme Court decisions. A quote from an 1849 Supreme Court case, Wilkes v. Dinsman, will give you a general idea of Clark's findings. I'm going to quote this case, but quite frankly, it presents many more, including numerous state Supreme Court cases right around 1871 that, that come to the same result. Quoting Wilkes now, while an officer acts within the limits of his discretion, the same law which gives it to him will protect him in the exercise of it. But for acts beyond his jurisdiction or attended by circumstances of excessive severity arising from ill will, a depraved dip disposition or vindictive feeling, he can claim no exemption and should be allowed none under color of his office. So, and I'm still quoting here, the officer being entrusted with a discretion for public purposes is not to be punished for the exercise of it, unless it's first proved against him either that he exercised the power confided in cases without his jurisdiction or in a manner not confided to him as with malice, cruelty, or willful oppression. In short, it is not enough to show he committed an error in judgment, but it must have been a malicious and willful error. As Keller discusses in greater detail, using again many state Supreme Court examples as well, these four treatises describe a freestanding immunity that governmental officers enjoyed in the, in the conduct of discretionary duties. Now this immunity had a few conditions. You might even call it qualified. An officer who acted entirely outside of his jurisdiction received no immunity. This historical immunity did not look to clearly established law, instead it looked to an officer's subjective motivations. But, and this is critical, plaintiffs had to prove a, an officer's bad faith with clear evidence. So history shows there is a shift here that we should acknowledge, that instead of looking at clearly established law at some level of generality, we required plaintiffs to show basically bad faith on the act of an officer, an improper motive, by clear evidence themselves. Now that's a difference, to be sure, but not so great a difference as abolishing immunity altogether would be. One more legal point. If qualified immunity's critics want to appeal to us as good textualists and good originalists, 
we should ask the same of them. We quote Fifth Circuit Judge Jim Ho, originalism for me, but not for thee, is not originalism at all. So to single out just qualified immunity for reexamination, but not, say, the scope, the original scope of Section 1983, or the existence of Bivens actions, or numbers of the Warren Court's criminal procedure jurisprudence, isn't textualism or originalism. It isn't principled. It's just an exercise in knocking down old precedents whose policy results you don't like. So I'll be eager to hear whether Clark is willing to revisit these precedents also. Finally, my prudential point. Maybe you disagree with me on everything I've said so far. I'm a small C conservative. I distrust revolutionary changes anywhere, so you can imagine how I feel about the modern era. If you share that inclination, let me appeal to it. First of all, we don't have to eliminate immunity in order to address many of the problems that Clark will, will raise. States, for example, are free to create their own state-based civil rights statutes, including ones for federal rights in the Constitution, and allow for suit in state court under these, functionally abolishing qualified immunity in that state. California's done this. That's part of what Nielsen and Walker to refer to as the federalism dimension of qualified immunity, where federal 1983 liability is a floor for official accountability, but not a ceiling. If a state wants to adjust the trade-offs between vindicating constitutional rights through a damages action and increasing uncertainty for police officers on the job, let that state make its own policy decisions and face its own voters without requiring it of everyone else. Second, there's a stare decisis argument. Now, no one has patience for stare decisis in the face of cases they don't like, much less cases they find unjust. That's the only place stare decisis does any work, though. Otherwise, you just uphold cases on the merits. As the Supreme Court has reminded us, stare decisis deserves special force and statutory precedents like Section 1983 and qualified immunity. As far as precedents go, this one is a doozy. The Supreme Court has affirmed qualified immunity quite literally dozens of times, with lower federal courts of appeal, again, applying it thousands or tens of thousands of times in the last decades. You can't abolish qualified immunity root and branch without first overruling these many thousands of precedents. And if stare decisis means anything to you as a legal concept, those numbers alone should give you pause. But frankly, what should really give you pause are the real world effects of overturning tens of thousands of cases. I don't want to talk about reliance interests in the abstract the way sometimes courts do when talking about stare decisis. So let's be clear about what Clark's about to propose to you. He wants to ask you to radically restructure the fundamental legal relationships between federal law, state officials, municipalities, local police departments, local officials, and law enforcement officers. I mean, Clark's nodding along, he agrees. This is a radical proposition. He wants to turn over a wide swath of state and local decisions over to federal courts to superintend, and he wants to give plaintiff's lawyers a powerful weapon to threaten police with. Eliminating qualified immunity, though it is very common in our discourse now, is not a modest step. It's an incredibly radical one. And if you're a temperamental conservative, you should be careful before giving into a radical demand in this a radical age. Thank you. Well, my hat, is off, my hat is off to Judd because um, the illegitimacy of qualified immunity is not even a close call. And it would take an advocate of uh, Judd's uh, exceptional ability to make it seem as if it were. Um, there's, as I said, it's not a close call on the law, it's not a close call on policy, not a close call from stare decisis. Um, qualified immunity is a completely illegitimate doctrine. It is morally illegitimate, it is legally illegitimate, it's illegitimate as a matter of text and history, uh, and as I will show, also as policy. Let me read a quote um, right off the bat. Here's the quote, the Supreme Court's treatment of qualified immunity under Section 1983 has not purported to be faithful to common law immunities that existed when Section 1983 was enacted. I'm sure Judd will recognize that quote, given that it was Alfred L., right? former boss, Justice Scalia in 1991. And I think there's something just perfectly on the nose uh, about using a forthcoming article from a Kennedy clerk, my good friend Scott Keller, to attack and challenge uh, a, a statement by Justice Scalia. Um, Justice Scalia, in fact, has the better of it. Um, the common law rule throughout our country's history has been something close to strict liability, which is not, by the way, the standard that Section 1983 imposes. I will get to that in a moment. Uh, but Justice Scalia definitely had the better of it. It is absolutely the case uh, 
that the Supreme Court's treatment of Section 1983, and specifically the invention out of whole cloth of the qualified immunity doctrine, has not purported to be faithful to common law immunities. And I'll be eager to read Scott Keller's forthcoming law review article. I'm sure it will be excellent. Everything that Scott does is excellent. But I will uh, note right off the bat that nobody, nobody, ever cited any of the sources that, that we heard uh, listed in this forthcoming article at the time that the, the qualified immunity doctrine was invented. So these will be entirely post hoc rationalizations for a legal doctrine that was invented out of whole cloth in the face of clearly contrary statutory text. Uh, that's the first and most important point. We can certainly argue about the desirability of qualified immunity as a policy, and I'm sure we will. I'll have some remarks about that. But what nobody should be confused about at the outset is whether qualified immunity is or is not a faithful interpretation of Section 1983. It is not. Even Aaron and Nielsen, who wrote an article that Judd referred to uh, earlier in his remarks, don't purport to, uh, they do not argue that qualified immunity represents the best interpretation of statutory, of, of uh, uh, Section 1983. Uh, they, they make a rather tepid argument that it represents perhaps a plausible interpretation. But no scholar that I'm aware of has ever taken the position that qualified immunity represents the best or most faithful interpretation of Section 1983, and I don't think such an argument is in fact tenable. How serious were courts about allowing individuals to hold government officials accountable uh, at the founding era and on into the 19th century when Section 1983 was enacted? There's a very interesting case called Little v. Barim from 1804, and it involved an American Navy captain who was ordered by the President of the United States to seize a ship that was coming out of a French port. Now, it turned out that at the time, the law only permitted the seizure of, um, uh, this was a Danish ship, of non-combatant ships that were entering French ports. So in following this order and seizing the Danish ship that was coming out of the French port, uh, the, the captain, the Navy captain, in fact, violated the law, but he did so at the express order of the president, and he raised that as a defense. And in deciding against the Navy captain in this 1804 case, Chief Justice Marshall recognized that his initial impulse was to grant immunity to this Navy captain because he was acting at the express orders of the President of the United States. But he went on to say, but it is still the law that controls, and in this case, this captain violated the law, and he is therefore liable. This was the common law background against which Section 1983 was in fact adopted, and there was something close to strict liability for government officials throughout most of our history. Now, um, I want to I want to quickly uh, address this issue about strict liability because I think it's very important uh, to 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 tackle right up front. It is absolutely not the case that eliminating qualified immunity would expose police officers and other government officials to a regime of strict liability. Why? It's because most of the relevant constitutional standards involved in qualified immunity cases have an element of subjectivity to them. It's built in by the very constitutional standards that are at stake in so many of these cases, including excessive force cases and unreasonable search cases. There's the key language right there unreasonable search and seizure. So even if you are denied qualified immunity as a government official and your case proceeds to a jury, which, side note, was in fact the institution that the founding era intended would resolve most disputes between the government and citizens, that they would be resolved by a jury for very good reasons. But if your case goes to a jury, you will not be held strictly liable. You will have an opportunity in most cases to explain to the jury why you believe that your decision at the time, whether it's to strike somebody after you had cuffed them, to look in somebody's trunk without their consent, or to steal $225,000 in currency and gold coins from their bedroom while executing a search warrant, which is an actual case that the Supreme Court denied cert on recently, you'll have an opportunity to explain to a jury why you believe that your conduct in that case was reasonable. And juries are extremely pro-law enforcement. They remain extremely pro-law enforcement, and the chances that you are going to win that civil damages case uh, against a civil rights plaintiff remain very high <clears throat> if there's any basis for arguing uh, that your conduct was uh, legitimate. Now, um, let's take a look at the, um, 
this idea that strict liability is an indispensable tool for protecting the good cops. This is not in, borne out by the empirical data, not remotely. Uh, Joanna Schwartz and other professors have examined this. There's been a number of articles written by Reuters recently where they've done a deep dive uh, on the empirical data about how often qualified immunity is used and in what context it's used. And it turns out that qualified immunity is only raised in about a third of the cases where it could be raised. This may seem rather strange, no, because this is such a powerful tool that law enforcement and other government officials have uh, to, to get a case dismissed, even, for example, when they have violated somebody's rights. You might think they use it in every case where it could plausibly be raised. It turns out not. Why? It's because other tools of civil procedure, including pleading requirements, including 12b6 motions to dismiss, including motions for summary judgment, they do a very good job of filtering out the truly unmeritorious cases. Those are the procedural and legal tools that good cops rely on when they are getting sued for doing something that wasn't really wrong. Those tools that are such a core part of our jurisprudence that we litigators use or respond to on a daily basis. They do tremendous work in Section 1983 cases. They do good work in Section 1983 cases, and they are the first resort of the good cop. Those are the tools that good cops uh, invoke when they really haven't done anything wrong. Who invokes qualified immunity? It is precisely the officers whose conduct is right near the line or across the line. Those are the officers and those are the incidents where qualified immunity is doing most of the work. It's where an officer has engaged in conduct that they know very well they may not be able to explain to a jury. Think about when qualified immunity is invoked and what the result is. The whole role of qualified immunity in our system is to ensure that that police officer or other government official doesn't have to explain why they did what they did to a jury. It is a tool that is invoked by people who understand that they are probably not going to be able to make a persuasive case or that it's going to be clear that they have in fact violated somebody's rights. And that really, at the end of the day, is the primary role of qualified immunity in our system. It does two major things. First, it discourages the filing of otherwise meritorious suits. And there's a lot of scholarship on this where civil rights plaintiff's attorneys have been asked, how important is qualified immunity as a part of your screening process? In other words, how likely are you to, to turn down an otherwise meritorious case where there really has been a civil rights violation because you know that you will not be able to surmount the clearly established requirement. You will not be able to identify a case in your jurisdiction where a police officer did essentially the exact same thing to somebody else. And make no mistake, that is the hurdle that you have to surmount. Judd says he's pretty confident that George Floyd's family's lawsuit will not be dismissed on qualified immunity grounds. I am not. I am not aware of any Eighth Circuit case in which a police officer knelt on somebody's, uh, on, a, on a handcuffed suspect's neck for nine minutes, a full two or three minutes after they lost consciousness, then failed to render medical aid after their heart stopped, and, and, and uh, the, the court held that that was excessive force. And make no mistake, the family will need to find a case nearly that analogous. That's how outrageous qualified immunity has become. Um, on paper, if you only listen to what the court says about qualified immunity, you might be bamboozled into thinking that, well, listen, you don't have to go out and find a functionally identical case in order to survive qualified immunity. You just have to find a case that's reasonably analogous to show that the police officer should have been on notice, that you don't kneel on somebody's neck for nine minutes while they're restrained until they die. That actually is not the real world. We litigators know that you don't listen just to what courts say. What's far more important is what courts actually do. Let me give you an example from the Sixth Circuit. One of the cases that the Supreme Court denied cert on back in May was called Baxter v. Bracey. And it was a police pursuit case involving a canine unit uh, where they cornered the guy, I think in a church basement. The suspect then sat down with his arms up in a position of surrender. There followed a pause of five to 10 seconds after which the officer in control of the dog released the dog and had the dog attack the suspect. He sustained a very serious injury that nearly killed him, required surgery, and he filed suit. The police officers invoked qualified immunity and argued that we don't have a sufficiently similar case on point to make the right at issue here uh, to be free from excessive force from a canine unit while you're in, in a position of surrender, clearly established. 
Good news for the plaintiff. There, in fact, was a Sixth Circuit case, just two years old, that would, might seem like it was directly on point. It was another pursuit case involving a canine unit. And similarly, when they caught up to the suspect, he lay down on the ground with his hands at his side in a position of surrender. And the Sixth Circuit said that it was a violation of his Fourth Amendment right against excessive, to be free from excessive force to release the dog um, when he was in that position, lying down with his hands at his side. And guess what? The Baxter v. Bracey panel distinguished that two-year-old case because it said there's enough of a difference between somebody sitting down with their hands up in a position of surrender and somebody lying down with their hands at their sides in a position of surrender. And that makes the two cases distinct. Distinct enough that the right to be free from being savaged by a police dog after you have surrendered is not sufficiently clearly established as to the gentleman who was sitting down with his hands up. That is, in fact, how qualified immunity works, and it works that way day in and day out. Judd, you're absolutely right. I could sit here all night and give example after example after example like that, but I won't. I'm going to give just one more example. This case comes out of the 11th Circuit. It's a case called Corbett v. Vickers. This is another pursuit case. The police caught up to the suspect on the front yard of a family whose children were outside playing at the time. The police officer tackles the suspect and makes everybody lie down on the ground in order to secure the scene. After he has handcuffed the suspect, the family dog comes out from underneath the house. The police officer draws his pistol, takes a shot at the dog, and misses. Dog retreats under the house. A couple minutes later, the same dog emerges again, not threatening, not barking, not putting anybody in danger. The same police officer pulls out his pistol again and shoots at the dog. He misses again, but this time he strikes a 10-year-old boy who is lying on the, on the grass at his feet in the back of the leg and nearly kills him. And again, Qualified immunity is granted to that police officer because apparently without an 11th Circuit case on point saying that you don't cook off shots on the front yard of, an, of a lawn that is occupied by a bunch of children who are lying down, you just wouldn't know not to do that. So there is a moral issue here and I've just presented it to you. And again, we could do case after case after case. Qualified immunity is not the, uh, the reserve or the defense of good cops who are making difficult decisions in in, in, in conditions of uncertainty and, and, and risk. Other procedural mechanisms are invoked by those good cops to make those unmeritorious cases go away. The primary role of qualified immunity in our system is to protect cops like the one in Corbett v. Vickers who cook off shots at unthreatening dogs and hit little kids in the back of the leg or steal $225,000 uh, from, uh, from somebody's room while executing a search warrant. That's a case called Jessup v. City of Fresno in the Ninth Circuit. The list goes on and on. Qualified immunity is a textually illegitimate, historically baseless, and morally indefensible legal doctrine that was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court and has created a massive double standard between the level of accountability that we as citizens are held to by law enforcement and the level of accountability that law enforcement insists upon when the shoe is on the other foot and they are the ones whose, whose conduct is at issue and they de demand an extraordinarily low level of accountability. How do they get it? They get it through a judge-made doctrine that is not a faithful interpretation of the congressionally acted statute and that has done more probably than any other judicial doctrine to undermine the integrity and the confidence that people have in law enforcement and to create the frustration and resentment that we have seen pouring out into the streets over the last couple months. People understand that they're being held to a different standard than police, that police get away with far too much misconduct, and that a big part of the reason for that is the judicially invented doctrine of qualified immunity it's time to get rid of it. Thank you, Clark. Uh, I think, Judd, at this point, if you wanted to make a rebuttal, you have the time to do that. Sure, sure. So a couple of points. Uh, Clark, I appreciate you rising to the occasion to defend my former boss, Justice Scalia. But unfortunately, you kind of proved my point about the halfway originalism thing, because remember in Crawford L, he specifically said that he wanted to reexamine both the section, the extent to 1983 liability, as well as the defenses. But you know, just to make a little bit broader of a point, it can't possibly be the case that qualified immunity as originally conceived of in, you know, the 60s and then the 80s, which, happy to admit, were not textualist courts by any sense, must be only defended on the grounds in which it was originally made, right, as opposed to you being able to update your defense or your attacks of it based on whatever new case comes out and every new 
every new possible interpretation, right? So in other words, if the Supreme Court happened to create a freestanding immunity that in fact mapped onto common law, even if they weren't thinking it at the time, it wouldn't be constitutionally legitimate, I'd hope you'd agree. Right? They might have just gotten to the right result for the wrong reason. I'm happy to agree that in fact, again, instead of clearly established law, the historical evidence that Keller points to is in favor of a basically a good faith test, whether or not an officer had acted in good faith. But again, the plaintiff would have to prove by clear evidence that the officer did not. Now, quite honestly, the fact you made a moral distinction between whether an officer's attorney relies on Iqbal for purposes of getting a case dismissed versus qualified immunity is a surprising one. I don't think I've ever encountered a lawyer who said, well, my client uh, is a good person, and so I'm going to make fewer defenses available to him. Whereas if my client secretly is guilty, I'm going to throw everything at the wall. I think what binds lawyers to making these strategic decisions is, of course, how effective they think the defenses are going to be, you know, what kind of a judge they're in front of, all that sort of thing. But quite frankly, I don't think guilty police officers think to themselves, I should tell my lawyer to rely on qualified immunity rather than saying, as opposed to Twombly or Iqbal, that just, that strikes me as deeply implausible. Uh, more fundamentally, I don't think you would take the sort of moral distinction among defenses to any other context. For example, I don't think, uh, you know, whatever our opinions about capital punishment, I don't think you would, de would decide that certain, uh, that certain ways of invoking EDPA or a 2254 remedy would be legitimate to defend against a capital sentence versus others in a moral sense. I think we look at ourselves as advocates and you make the arguments you think you're going to be able to win at. So to kind of take a bigger critique of your saying that, uh, that in fact qualified immunity works for, officer, for bad officers, well, the problem is I also have read Joanna Schwartz's Hale Law Review article, and she specifically says that you actually can't exclude the possibility of qualified immunity based on even her data. The qualified immunity is, uh, is in fact keeping out bad claims because of course it is. Again, this is sort of a simple supply of law and demand function. And more fundamentally here, you're kind of pinging between two points that I don't think you can get out of, which is one, you like to insist qualified immunity is incredibly essential for its deterrent effects. That without qualified immunity, we'll be able to police uh, bad officer action. And with it, we're left in sort of a regime where police officers are able to do whatever they want. and We're all sort of helpless to, to deal with it. But then also you maintain that in fact, police officers sort of aren't the ones who are, who are subjected to these judgments. They're not, you know, they're basically, they're not actually put in the vice by this. It's not going to be such a strict liability regime. It's not going to be terrible. And I don't think you get a deterrent effect from a regime that doesn't meaningfully increase the risk of exposure of liability to police. Otherwise, you're going to have to explain your theory of deterrence to me. You know, the idea that there's, that we don't deal with a strict liability regime just because we go to a jury, just conflating two different concepts, right? Juries may very well be officer friendly. I think it probably depends right now on the regime and where you're getting a jury pool from. I would imagine, for example, the attitudes of police officers in Austin, Texas, and that in El Paso probably differ a significant amount. Or, for example, Portland, Oregon, and, you know, name, name another, uh, another sort of division in another district. So, I expect I would see real differences in, in opinions there, but more importantly, the Fourth Amendment's reasonableness analysis isn't anything like a subjective test. It's entirely objective. I mean, reasonableness almost always means objective. The only context in which I'm aware that the Supreme Court has relied on a good faith subjective intentions test in the Fourth Amendment uh, is for the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule, which I haven't heard you mention that you'd also be willing to revisit, Clark. Um, hopefully you are. But more fundamentally, these various constitutional torts, some of them don't, in fact, have, uh, have a mens rea requirement or particular mindset requirement. And fundamentally, being able to be held essentially without a, I made a reasonable mistake defense or something of that order with good faith defense, which, again, history well supports. I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to go through Keller's article and quote many of the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court cases the outlines, I just feel like it'd be sort of cheap grace for me to take uh, credit for his work. To say that that basis, you know, that this doctrine is both going to be harmless and illegitimate, but also it's going to effectively police the police just doesn't hit my ear the right way. I think that's not particularly plausible. So, you know, you said a lot, we've got a lot to go through. Uh, I would say if it's completely illegitimate, then unfortunately, many state Supreme Courts in the middle 19th century and the four most prominent treatise authors happen to disagree with you, Clark, and we'll have to let the viewers decide who they want to believe.
Clark, if you want to make a response, please. Yeah, I'll just say really quickly, I'm, I'm having a little trouble following Judd's argument in turn. I, I, if I understood, I haven't seen the Keller article, I guess it's still forthcoming. But my, I thought I heard him say that, that kind of the most that, that Keller sources add up to is that there may have been some, some kind of a sort of genuine good faith standard back then. Um, and I don't think that, it, I don't have any objection to, to a sort of a, um, a, a, an actual good faith standard. Um, I don't think that's going to um, um, really apply to many of the cases that have generated the most outrage. There's no possible way uh, for a police officer who steals $225,000 in, in, in gold coins and, and, and currency while executing a search warrant to say, oh, I did that in good faith. And again, I could roll out those cases for. Oh, I'm sure. Look, I'm, I, to, to hit the ear about someone just making off with a bunch of gold coins sounds, sounds like something cartoonish. And like I said, I'm, I am super glad to say if there's nothing else in the record, nothing else in the facts there that makes that sound a little more reasonable, then of course that's insane, right? Of course that's inappropriate. The well, problem is, of course, yeah. is we're talking about a million officers. And, sure, know, I can talk about other cases, including, including leaving a person in a jail cell for six days that's covered in feces and making him eat all of his meals in an open sewer. You, um, probably you have some familiarity with that case, but it's still under litigation, so... I'm going to stay away from it, but but trust me, I don't just have to talk about City of Fresno and police officers stealing money. They engage. There was a tremendous amount of police misconduct that ends up uh, getting excused on qualified immunity grounds that they know very well. They could never make a case that they were exercising good faith at the time. But we can debate that later. Good faith is not a standard that was chosen by Congress in the text of Section 1983. That's the point. Now, whether you can plausibly infer. Uh, against common law principles operable at the time, that's going to be an interesting fight that will come into litigation, I'm sure, at some point. My guess is that it's not going to get much traction. Courts generally are not super favorable uh, to post hoc rationalizations of doctrines that have been on the books and, and are not working well, as I don't think qualified immunity is working well. Of course, unless you work with the government, then it's working great. Um, I'm not to say they're completely resistant to them, and of course, anytime the government asserts a post hoc rationalization, they tend to get much more mileage out of it um, than a non-government uh, party. I recognize that, certainly. Let me just, two more points, and then uh, we'll be interested to take questions. Um, first of all, uh, I don't really necessarily understand the point about um, uh, police officers holding back uh, defenses and, you know, only deploying, uh, uh, you know, the, the Iqbal motion to dismiss standard. The point about qualified immunity is that you can hold it in your back pocket. There are a lot of other defenses that you assert before you assert qualified immunity. I would even go so far as to say qualified immunity is kind of the last refuge of scoundrels in civil rights litigation. You'd much rather win a case on 12 v. 6 grounds or even at summary judgment, and that is, in fact, what seems to happen more often. Uh, again, qualified immunity plays a very particular role in our system, uh, which is to involve the judiciary in excusing or at least letting officers off the hook for conduct that everybody recognizes the officer would probably have a very difficult time uh, justifying to a jury. That really is, in my view, the central role of qualified immunity in our system. It's ensuring non-liability for officers that either have clearly violated uh, a constitutional right, and everybody agrees that they did, or uh, the officer or the other government official recognizes they're probably not going to be able to make a very persuasive case that what they did was reasonable, and they know they're going to lose that case. That's why they're invoking qualified immunity. Last point. Um, I don't think deterrence, I, I agree that cops generally are not motivated by uh, the prospect of civil liability. That doesn't seem to influence their decision making in the field all that much. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, because 99.98% of all civil damages awards are paid by us, the taxpayers, because of indemnification, not the rights violating police officer, which is a whole separate issue. Uh, but more importantly, the incentive effects, I think, will come through the, um, the, the, the structure, the organizational structure of the police department. Cities and police departments will not uh, appreciate the vastly greater exposure that they have to damages once the qualified immunity doctrine is eliminated, and they will have a greater incentive to eliminate the bad apples, the so-called bad apples. And it really is the case, by the way. Everybody agrees that most police misconduct claims, most viable police misconduct claims are generated by a very small fraction of officers who it is very difficult to get rid of. 
the elimination of qualified immunity will increase the incentive of cities and departments to get rid of these claims generating bad apples. That's where the incentive effects will come from. And I hope we can all agree that a world in which this subset of bad apple police officers are no longer working as police officers is a very desirable future, not just in general terms, but also in terms of addressing this extraordinary outpouring of resentment and frustration that we've been seeing in the last couple of months throughout the country. Um, a, 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 a police culture in which bad apples are no longer around, allowed to stick around and continue generating massive damages claims through their misconduct, I think is a very desirable scenario for everybody. We want to ask Anthony. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna present a couple of questions and then we're gonna turn to Q and A. We have, we have a lot of questions and I'm gonna try to get through them quickly. Uh, so I guess the first one I, I would, I would wanna ask is, given Justice Thomas's concurring opinion in Ziegler against the bossy and the dissent from the denial of certiorari and Baxter, um, as well as the fact that the court received several requests for cert in qualified immunity, um, but none were granted. So where does the doctrine go from here? So actually I'm gonna, do you wanna say who you're pitching to to, to speak first? Cause I don't wanna just jump in if you meant for Clark to answer that. I have no preference. That All right, never mind. I'll just jump in. So what Clark says about how, you know, courts disfavor post hoc explanations, all that, that's when courts are dealing with the executive. Uh, courts love post hoc explanations for their own decisions. Uh, in fact, we have principles about it in litigation where, for example, if you're, uh, if you're defending against an appeal, you're entitled to make any argument, whether or not you present it below, whether or not it's in the record, in support of the judgment, right? So the Supreme Court absolutely accepts uh, essentially improved arguments for the same results they've come to. Now, to be clear, what I'm defending is something, as Clark points out, it is, is in fact different to have a good faith basis than a clearly established law basis. Of course, Clark skates over that I'm saying that a plaintiff is going to have to, at the initial stage, show clear evidence of bad faith, which I think in combination of Iqbal is quite frankly going to lead us to much the same result because it's just very hard at the initial pleading stage to show bad faith, but put that aside. The Supreme Court does, in fact, consider whether or not it can get to the same answer, basically the same answer doctrinally, the same way, when it's considering precedent. I mean, stare decisis is a real force for a good number of members of the court, and none of us love it for purposes of the cases that we like, uh, or rather for cases we hate, and we all love it for the cases that we like. And so the idea that the Supreme Court would take up qualified immunity you know, wholesale, if it believes that there's a, a real sincere way of getting the same or same-ish answer when it's, when it's come to the same place over and over and over again, I'm not going to say it's, I'm not going to say there's no hope for it. I mean, personnel changes matter on the court a lot, and the court held a lot of these petitions for a reason, but I think having chosen not to take this up, they're either looking for a very specific case, or otherwise, they're simply just not going to revisit qualified immunity wholesale for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so the good news about qualified immunity is that there are two paths to uh, fixing it, by which I mean eliminating it. Uh, keep in mind, it's not a constitutional doctrine. It purports to be an interpretation of a congressionally enacted statute. So that means that the Supreme Court could eliminate qualified immunity by revisiting the precedents in which they created it out of whole cloth. Uh, or Congress could amend Section 1983 to make clear that there is no qualified immunity defense to civil rights claims under Section 1983. Something, by the way, that the Colorado legislature just did this summer. They enacted a state version of Section 1983 that applies to state constitutional violations and expressly uh, 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 made clear in the law that there is no qualified immunity defense after holding hearings about whether to include qualified immunity. So um, we could see uh, uh, essentially reform proceeding along two different paths. I don't know what happened. I, it's very strange. The Supreme Court, um, as Judd pointed out, uh, clearly held all these qualified immunity cases, some of which had been ripe for more than a year, uh, for a reason. And they kept rescheduling and rescheduling the conference. At the end, there were something like eight or ten of them pending, and then they were just all denied. Now, keep in mind what was happening back in May when these eight or ten cert petitions involving qualified immunity were uh, denied. What was happening is that Congress appeared like it was finally going to get serious about police reform. This was in the wake of the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis, uh, and it really appeared that, that at the top of Congress's legislative list of priorities was police reform. As we all know, it didn't turn out that way, but a way I like to describe it is that um, if, uh, 
if you are in an airplane that needs to be landed immediately, maybe you've got an engine malfunction or something like that, um, you don't want the pilot and the co-pilot fighting over control of the airplane. You want one person to be in charge of landing that airplane. I, that, my guess is that that was probably on the mind of at least some of the Supreme Court justices, that if it looks like Congress is serious about police reform, that it might not be helpful to have the Supreme Court grant cert uh, in a qualified immunity case or more than one uh, and, and send kind of maybe confounding signals about the possibility that the court itself is going to correct this uh, problem. Now, of course, it didn't turn out that way, and I think that it's possible we could be looking at a somewhat clean slate uh, the next time a, a new slate of qualified immunity cases is presented to the court, depending on what does or doesn't happen legislatively in the next six to 12 months. There's kind of, there's kind of, there's kind of two things you brought up that I wanted to, that, uh, I wanted to vamp on a little bit, Clark. The first one is it's always the possibility that the Supreme Court uh, whenever the Supreme Court deals with qualified immunity, it's doing one of two things, right? It's either dealing with the substance of the statute in which it's purporting to interpret either its own precedents or 1983, or it's engaging in its supervisory authority over lower courts, such as when it had the Saucier, you know, before Pearson order of battle. And it could well be one of your common critiques uh, is that this sort of stunts the development of, co of constitutional common law. And it could very well be the Supreme Court thinks it might be better to go back to the Saucier regime but it needed to have a petition in which there actually is a difference in the outcome, or at least a difference in the outcome of the holding for which to be. That, that wouldn't surprise me to the extent that we're dealing with a Roberts court that, that favors incremental change, especially sort of incremental approaches to things. That would strike me as sort of a very good, first, uh, very good first step if it wanted to go down this road. And it sort of proves the point about how extreme what you're proposing really is, because as you point out, Colorado did exactly that. It functionally eliminated 1983 uh, qualified immunity in the state. Given that the court can, that not only Congress, but each individual state can decide to what extent it wants to address this problem, uh, you know, tearing up tens of thousands of cases is less and less necessary to get at some of the problems you're addressing. We have just a variety of other issues, and I think very few people would, at least temperamentally conservative people, would instinctively think, well, I have three or four different ways of addressing this. Let's go to the most drastic one right now. Yeah, so I got to say really quickly how funny this is to, to hear because I heard exactly the same thing when I was helping revive the Second Amendment. Uh, it just happened that all of these comments were coming from a different end of the political spectrum in terms of how radical the move was and how we're flaunting stare decisis and how we should allow things to proceed incrementally. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to take a holier than thou considering who I just worked for. <laughs> Very good. So we're going to get, I'm going to ask one more and then we have some Q&A that, that are directed. So it'll be one to Clark, one to Judd. Um, so the, the question that I have is that I think it's fair to conclude if we were to reach the point where qualified immunity would be abolished, there would be more lawsuits under this regime. Would you two both agree? Of course. Sure. So in high volume districts pre-COVID, the time to get a civil trial was in some cases as long as 18 months. And so if we see an increase of, of lawsuits, presumptively it will be in those high volume districts as well as in a, my, a myriad of other places. Um, so how do we avoid adding to an already burdened ju judiciary and to a lesser extent, what would we say to those who maintain the position that justice delayed is justice denied? Well, keep in mind that the primary role of qualified immunity is to derail otherwise meritorious cases and that there are plenty of qualified immunity cases in which every judge that looks at the case agrees that there was a constitutional violation and therefore by extension an injury, uh, but that because of qualified immunity and because the, the right at issue was not sufficiently clearly established, the case should be dismissed. What we're talking about here is that a lot of what qualified immunity does is to deny recovery to people whose rights have been violated by agents of the state. And if we're all going to sit around wringing our hands over the prospect that some of these injured people will suddenly have the ability to bring suit in federal court, just like Congress intended that they would be able to do, keep in mind the language, the unambiguous language of Section 1983, which says that um, state actors shall be liable to the person injured for the deprivation of any right. So what qualified immunity does is essentially to just shrink the population and says that, that um, state actors shall be liable uh, to only certain people whose rights have been uh, violated. So again, we hear this every single time there's any kind of an expansion of, of, of sort of constitutional doctrine. 
When we litigated the Heller case, we heard from all kinds of people, oh, there's going to be so much more litigation. Every time the Supreme Court expands its understanding of the First Amendment, for example, to protect commercial speech, oh, there'll be so much more litigation. But keep in mind why there's more litigation. It's because people whose rights were violated, who up until that point had no avenue of redress, are suddenly finding that they do have an avenue of redress. The number of people whose rights are violated remains the same. The only thing that changes is the number of people who actually get to get into court to seek redress for the violation of those rights. Judd, do you have a quick response? Because I want to get these last two questions. Notably, they're not necessarily debate as it's individual one. Sure, sure. So. sure. Uh, then um, I'll just keep my response very quick. I'm, sure. uh, I'm profoundly surprised to hear that level of confidence in trial attorneys that only the suits that are good are being kept out. And indeed, there are no merit meritless suits being, uh, being withheld. That's a very surprising development, and I'll be glad to note it for the next commentary on how Rule 11 gets changed, I suppose. But you can't... You'll have a difficult time finding, me say, finding that from me in the transcript, I suspect. Yeah, you can't... I mean, you can't really think that Congress doesn't intend a common law defense to apply just because it doesn't mention it, do you? Do you think, you think Congress didn't intend self-defense in the Crimes Act of 1790? No, but I think the consensus is pretty clear that no, no one really thought that Congress intended um, a clearly established... Um, doctrine, uh, anything like what we have now. I don't think there's really any serious assertion that they did. Well, I'm gl I'll be glad to send you the paper making a serious assertion for it. And look, again, we might be less far away on this particular narrow point than we think, because the regime I've described, uh, I've, regime, I've received uh, the paper, I've looked over some of the original sources, seems to be a compelling case that there was, in fact, a freestanding immunity that was tethered to, again, jurisdiction of the, of the discretionary action, in fact, you can explain Little v. Barim a little bit by, the, quite frankly, the statute simply was so outrageously misread by, uh, by the president that there's no way of seeing that as a reasonable basis for jurisdiction, um, that the person wasn't acting with malice and the plaintiff had the burden to, to, show, uh, to show bad faith in the action. So if that's what you're referring to as a freestanding immunity, I think there is a good case for it. But no, the clearly established law part is obviously just me. That part is. So the quick question, Clark, first, if Congress came to you, and some of the audience, if Congress came to you asking you to write an analogous defense to Section 1983, would you oppose any qualified immunity defense whatsoever, or is there a lesser form of qualified immunity you could support? Um, no, I would not. Uh, so I, I think that you could absolutely make <clears throat> a case for some sort of a good faith uh, standard, the, the, the sort of the... Um, the, the narrowest version of that was the one that was issued in the 1967 case, Pearson v. Ray, where what happened was that the, the officers in that case enforced a law that was at the time understood to be constitutional. It was only later that it was struck down. Uh, and, and their argument was, look, we were enforcing a law that everybody thought was constitutional at the time. Why should we uh, you know, be subject to liability just because it later got struck down. I don't think that's an unreasonable uh, uh, policy. It, it happens not to be the policy that, that, that is articulated in the text of Section 1983, but if somebody wanted to advocate for that, I would say, you know, that's a, that's a perfectly um, a principled argument. My personal approach would be that I would go all the way back to the actual text of Section 1983 um, that, that creates liability for the deprivation of any right and see how that works. And if it turns out that that really is unworkable or unmanageable somehow, and we have to uh, essentially exclude uh, from the population of people who are entitled to get relief some subset of people whose rights have been violated, then we might consider that. But I think the default should be that if a government official violates your rights, then you should be entitled to some form of, of redress. Again, so Judd, the last question is yours, and it's from a, a member of the audience as well. And it says, it's a two part, uh, is your concern for the fiscal liability of, quote, good, unquote, police officers obviated by the high rate of indemnification? And second, what is the propriety of federal courts reading a state common law tort defense into a federal civil rights statute? Uh, great questions. They're sort of two entirely different directions, so I'll have to, I'll sort of have to keep both in mind when I answer. Uh, so the first part is, of course, well, you heard Clark cite the Joanna Schwartz article saying it was 99.98. Uh, were paid by a percentage were paid by sources other than the police officer. That's of course in part because municipal and state officials have decided to calibrate their willingness to indemnify precisely to the existence of qualified immunity. The idea that this wouldn't shift, uh, the idea that Clark agrees, the idea that this wouldn't shift uh, as a result of qualified immunity going away is is quite frankly just it's, it's bonkers. It's just counter. It's counterfactual in a way that no one can take seriously. Uh, as a matter of fact, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Nielsen and uh, Christopher Walker also sort of outlined uh, 
these indemnification statutes and talked about their exclusions. So for example, many of them exclude indemnification for punitive damages, uh, for conduct undertaken under one form or another, a bad action that may or may not be, uh, for which an officer may or may not be immune right now. I think 36 of them, something on that order. So it just can't possibly be the case that a qualified immunity regime would both deter police and also police wouldn't have to pay for judgments uh, against them in a 1983 regime without qualified immunity. So I think it must be the case that the various ways in which uh, expectations have been settled around official accountability take qualified immunity both as a given and as a central piece. And indemnification litigation has grown up around that. And so without immunity, you're going to see different polities uh, deciding to or not to indemnify officers. And I would expect in the circumstances in which we have, well, let's just imagine the, the abolition of immunity and nothing else. I would imagine in jurisdictions that have strong police unions or strong public worker protections, which is basically every large city, uh, as far as police go at least, you would expect that they would bargain basically for, uh, basically to be paid for the additional civil liability risk. Um, I would expect police unions would say, well, we're not immune from this now. You're going to make us shoulder this rather than indemnifying us. We want a greater salary. So there's not a world in which, uh, there's not a world in which there's not going to be some sort of payment from the public fisc in this kind of indemnification. It's just going to be how we do it. Uh, but I think otherwise, there's simply, we'd have a shortage of police officers worse than we do now. Uh, the second part is the propriety of reading state defenses into a federal statute. Uh, I think, uh, respectfully, you misunderstand the purpose of citing the state Supreme Court decisions. It wasn't to prove the existence of a specific state defense. It's to sort of prove that this was what the common law was understood as back before Erie when federal, when federal courts had common law making abilities for one uh, and for two, sort of what the common understanding in 1871 would have been about whether or not such a statute with this kind of right of action would have understood to have a freestanding immunity exception that wasn't, that didn't need to be put into the statute the way that often Supreme Court and other courts read it not to have. So a variety of these courts had for similar state acts, not necessarily civil rights acts, but actions that could be made against officers, confirmed in just the same way that I read to you from, uh, from the Supreme Court, confirmed that there was in fact a sort of good faith liability of one sort or another, or a requirement of proving malice or an excess of jurisdiction. So the point is to use the, the courts along with the Supreme Court to show that this was sort of the widespread understanding, the same reason behind the treatises, not that federal law would borrow from state law in some sort of you know, reverse eerie way. way. Well, that concludes uh, the debate. I, I thank you both. I'm not going back to the phone for a second clap session, although I, it, I, I think it was quite fun. Um, but a few housekeeping bef events before we go. Uh, first, I mean, to, to those that's still in attendance, if you enjoyed any of our events, so we'd like to urge you to consider joining the, the Federalist Society. Membership is in a national chapter, of which uh, the El Paso chapter is, a, is one, indeed. Um, the National Federalist Society helps fund these events, and, and that when we have them in person, we'll, we'll bring people out so that we can have in person as opposed to only Zoom. Um, but as a practical matter, uh, given that we are a new chapter, we're interested in hearing feedback from attendees. Uh, we have an email, it's bedsock El Paso. It's pretty catchy, I'm, I, I concede. Um, and if you have any questions or you wanna make recommendations of future events, we'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you again all for coming and have a wonderful day.